Hello, everyone. Let's give everyone a, a second to connect to audio. Welcome back. Hope you had a great break and were able to stretch your legs, especially after such an invigorating talk by Wu Lei. And welcome back. My name is Allison Cardona. I'm the California State Director for the UC Davis Correct Shelter Medicine Program and your moderator for this session. In the spirit of describing for folks who are, have low vision, uh, I am a middle-aged Latino woman with uh, medium length, dark brown hair with a gray stripe and wearing a black and green sweater. And you have joined our talk for our Health and Human Services audience called Racial and Economic Inequalities of Pet-Friendly Housing Distribution. This short talk will provide an overview of racial and economic inequalities of pet-friendly housing, citing research on housing related owner on housing related owner surrenders to animal shelters with case examples. The presenters will talk specifically about domestic violence housing and shelters and what you can do to become better informed as providers. We'll also have a candid conversation about these realities and the best practices to develop to begin to integrate the services both human and animal organizations provide. And it's my honor to introduce the two speakers. Diana Prado is the founder and executive director of the Housing Equity and Advocacy Resource Team, also known as Heart LA, a legal nonprofit that helps ensure people and their pets remain housed. Diana started her career as a staff attorney with the Eviction Defense Network and later joined Inner City Law Center in 2012, where she defended tenants in evictions and sued slumlords in affirmative litigation suits. Diana is an appointed public member of the California Veterinary Medical Board, trainer and consultant for the Stay Housed Los Angeles SHLA Eviction Defense Program, and a lecturer in, lecturer in law for UCLA Law School teaching Los Angeles housing law and policy. Joining Diana is Brian Chase. Brian is general counsel of Michelson Philanthropies. Prior to joining Michelson Philanthropies, he was assistant general counsel for AIDS Healthcare Foundation, one of the largest nonprofit providers of HIV AIDS medical care to underserved people around the world. Brian was the first attorney in the Dallas office of Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, a national LGBT legal organization. While working with Lambda, Brian was part of the appellate team for Lawrence v. Texas at the United States Supreme Court. Brian attended law school at Tulane University and earned an undergraduate degree in religion from Wake Forest University. Welcome to you both. Hello, hello. I love the fact that when you have two lawyers talking, you have to put the word short in the actual program name to get us to shut up. Um, so we've only got a half hour, but I think we've got a lot of info we'd like to share. I want to first start off um, talking about some personal experiences I've had with uh, the domestic sheltering community, domestic violence shelter communities. Um, when I first started this job 10 years ago, I was at UCLA at a legal recruiting fair, and the person next to me was the general counsel for Rainbow Services, which is a domestic violence shelter in San Pedro, California. I asked her if they uh, accepted pets, and she said they don't. Um, they were interested in it, but they neither had the money nor the expertise to do it. So I'm like, well, we got money and expertise. Um, so I went to my boss and said, hey, can I write these nice people a check so they can let cats and dogs into the domestic violence shelter? And she's, of course. So we provided them with policies and supplies and a very small amount of money, like $7,500 to build out one of their residential units, just one room um, to be pet friendly. We put in a cattery, we built a dog run for them. It was pretty simple and straightforward. And I didn't hear back from them for a long time after we'd set up the program. Uh, then I reached back out to them a few years later to see how it was going and to um, talk about maybe having them do some speaking engagements on that program. It turned out that the reason they had never come back to us for more money for the program was because it was so wildly successful that their normal funders, when they came in and saw how happy the children were, not just the children with pets, but the children who were 
did not have pets in the shelter to have dogs and cats running around. So their other donors immediately built out half of their other spaces to be pet friendly because the program was so successful. Well, this is a shelter that uh, at the time at least didn't have a single resident whose primary language was English. Everyone in the shelter were people of color, um, extremely disadvantaged, numerous first generation immigrants, some documented, some not documented. Um, so this is not a particularly well-funded organization, but just having a little bit of help made a huge difference. And the reason this is important is because in multiple surveys, it's been found that domestic abusers use pets as leverage. And if you can't get safe housing for the victims of domestic violence, they tend to stay in these relationships. 71% um, of people in shelters report that their abuser threatened pets. And 82% of those said that the reason for the threats against the pets was to keep the victim in the house and out of shelters. And I have some personal experience with this. A few years ago, um, I received a request for help. A woman had left her husband and as a response, the husband, I hesitate to even call him that, broke three of their dog's legs and sent the victim photos of the injured pet. Um, so we worked with animal services. We paid for some medical support for the pet. Um, and fortunately, the woman and her children were kept safe. But that is the kind of lengths that some of these abusers will go to. And it really underscores the importance of making sure that sheltering environments, both for domestic violence and for homelessness, are pet friendly. Um, the Pet and Women Safety Act, which was passed a few years ago, but only recently um, given some substantial funding, uh, it uh, allows domestic violence shelters to apply for federal funding in order to make their spaces pet friendly. The budget is not huge. Uh, in 2022, it was only $3 million. Uh, but considering the size of the need and how little it costs to build out shelters, uh, I think it's a very important first step for getting more shelters. That act is part of the Farm Bill, and it's generally referred to as the PAWS Act. Um, now, that's that's the beginning of my presentation. So I'd like to, to pass it on, and hopefully we'll still have some time for conversation and questions at the end. Yes, and hi, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's so exciting. My name is Diana Prado. Um, I use she, her pronouns, Aja. I am a five-foot um, Latina woman of, come on, Latina woman of color, and I am wearing a black top with, like, um, fun little um, rose little earrings that I very much enjoy. Um, thank you, Allison, for doing that. I'm like, that was a great reminder. And also from the talk yesterday, I love that. So hello, we are here to talk about the racial disparities and what's going on with housing and pets. Um, and particularly Heart LA focuses on helping keeping their pets and people together and housed. So first, I just want to kind of start off with what this scene is currently, and we're located in um, Los Angeles County. So currently in 2019, there was 40,000 pre-pandemic. Wow, can you believe that we're in a time that we can say pre and post pandemic or not even post, but mm -hmm. anyways, um, in 2019, there was about 45,557 evictions filed. And that's about five families evicted every hour in, um, in LA County. And then during the pandemic, we had emergency protections. And it drastically brought down those numbers, even though there was something that's called eviction moratorium, meaning that people thought there couldn't be evictions, that actually didn't stop landlords from filing evictions. So even though this may, I don't know, to some of you be like, what? Um, yeah, people were still getting evicted <laughs> during the pandemic. I'm only laughing because if you laugh, maybe it makes the pain feel a little bit better. Um, and now in 2022, um, the numbers, so they had gone down to about 12,000 in 2020, 2021. And then in 2022, we are back to th almost 35,000 evictions filed in LA County, which equates to about now four families evicted every hour. And that's on a rise. Just two days ago in LA County, um, the LA County Board of Supervisors, three of them, Holly Mitchell, um, um, Han, and Barger, voted no 
to end the emergency protections. Um, on And two of the supervisors that we commended, Solis and Horvath, brought the motion to extend the protections. So March 31st of this year, tenants with pets or that had additional occupants um, are going to be um, getting a 30 days to be evicted. Why am I sharing all of this with you? Because at the end of the day, what is the reality is that um, one in four renters, well, one in four renters spend over 70% of their income and in housing costs. And 80% of the people facing eviction are black and Latinx people, right? And also black households are twice as likely of being evicted than white households. So the reality of what's going on is that when I say four families are evicted an hour right now, that means that two of those families are likely black households, right? One of those families, likely a Latino household, and maybe another than being a white household. But probably all four of those families are families that are people of color, low-income people of color. That is the reality of the life of what's going on right now, right? How about the fact that 70% of the people spend their income on rent? What? Right? So here we are at what minimum wage is now like 17 an hour. Is that what it is? I don't, I don't, I'm, someone, will, someone will write this in the chat and then we'll know, um, which gets us to, to what. And, and, and when we talk about this, we can't ignore the fact that also, okay, so then bridging this with animal welfare. Sorry, now I'm on a rant. I was inspired uh, by Vu's. I was inspired by Vu's. Um, I don't know if anyone saw Vu speak earlier about um, funding, but it was like, yes, preach. You know, what's real about animal welfare is that it's predominantly white. It's predominantly white. And so when we're coming in and we're bringing then also the housing element into it, I mean, it wasn't until, I mean, it still exists that a lot of people in animal welfare believe that you have to have a home, home to even own a dog, <laughs> right? Sure, this is why we're having this co-shelter and collaborative, right? Because it's a bunch of us that are now are like-minded are coming together and we're like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. But when we put that all together, those people that are most predominantly affected that have pets are folks of color. And here we are in a space that's very predominantly white that's now trying to integrate all of this. It's, it's um, not easy to talk about, right? It's, um, I know that one of the questions in coming here, I read like, I'm like, ooh, who has a question? It was like, hey, how do we bring, like, I don't know, I think it was like more like, how do we bring effective change or how do we make this non-racist practices in a place that wants to be gentrified and wants to be beautified, right? Like LA County, it's full of sky rises that are empty because nobody can afford $4,000 rent. Meanwhile, the unhoused population has tripled. I mean, I don't know the facts on it, but I can see it. <laughs> I don't know the facts on it, but I can see it when I'm what, um, it's, it's, it's wild. And so, um, I'm like, I'm like, where, I'm like, where am I getting with all of this? That, well, that, how do we change it? Well, we talk about it. That's why we're having this short talk about it. We acknowledge, right? It's kind of like when you go to an AA meeting, like the first thing you got to do is actually acknowledge you have a problem. <laughs> if we don't acknowledge we have a problem, then we can't do anything about it. If we can't have those uncomfortable conversations about like, hey, you know what? Property rights is kind of a sham. Property rights is rooted in racism. Do we all know that we actually got property rights through something called the Discovery Doctrine, which was Judge Marshall in three different cases that said that, oh, because we, because someone discovered, get this, this is what blows my mind. I laugh so much. Also that I'm like, I'm like the attorney that doesn't like attorneys. I'm like the non-attorney attorney. attorney. <laughs> um, but it blows my mind. So we got property rights by by a judge agreeing that since someone discovered America, despite the fact that there were already people here, that allowed them to then have the rights over the property. The discovery doctrine, the irony of that now, given our immigration policies, right? That's what our property rights is rooted in, y'all. So if we can acknowledge the racist roots of where property rights is, and in terms of how that literally permeates through and that's the tree that we grew of what we now call property and housing then hey we we really need to sit with that and if that hurts if that's like oh well hey i'm not here for everyone to like me i'm not here for everyone to agree with me i'm just here to spit knowledge and spit truth and let you know how that's going to sit with you right um like yeah i just said that 
for real, because that's the realities of where we are. Because now when we deal with pets and housing, then we have the issue of all of the racist, like biases that we don't even know that exist with us. Like, does your dog sleep in your bed with you? Um, does your dog sleep inside? Oh, your dog's in your yard. What? Like, do, do you love your dog? Is that dog loved? I'm sure. Does that dog love to be outside? Outside? I'm sure it does too. But those all lie in together. Um, and then I'm like, I know, there's like 2.30. I'm like, I don't even know where I'm renting with this. Because I'll also share that in my organization, what's very sad that we've seen um, very often is that it's the unhoused people of color that have their dogs stolen from them from rescues. The rescues will yeah. say that they're going to take their, that they're going to take care of their dog. And then they don't, right? The last, um, the last person that reached out to us was a black, was a, was a black woman with their purebred Yorkie, right? That the rescue took it because I'm sure that the rescue thought like, why is this unhoused person have a purebred Yorkie? <laughs> right? I'm guessing. I have no idea. We reached out and we didn't hear back. But this is the reality of what's going on in the animal welfare community. And, um, you know, what we can do about it is talk about it, talk about how, you know, there can be the applications that rescues use is, you know, a not very front, like a bit ridiculous and racist, frankly, and probably violating a bunch of fair housing and discriminatory <laughs> practices. But we can't go after one rescue one at a time, right? Nor is that like the witch hunt to do, right? What it is, it's not a witch hunt, it's a conversation. It's a conversation and people realizing like, huh, I don't know, that's kind of weird. Maybe I'll look back at my application, right? If, 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 if anything, what happens is that people go back and look at their applications and change them a bit. Wow. Then we won a little today, right? We won a little today. Um, yeah, I think that's, um, I, I will also, I'm like, I'm like, sad. I'm like, and then I'm like, also in terms of affordable and pet inclusive housing that exist in Los Angeles, um, I just did the 50 mile radius. I use my pitbullisfamily.org plug, ding. Um, my pitbullisfamily.org. And I use their awesome map that's revamped and everything. Just saying, it's very fancy. Uh, I love it. And there was 15, was it 15 properties um, in the 50 mile area. So it included even parts of Orange County and up in the Valley, that's not even LA County that were pet inclusive. And of those, only two didn't include fees because, and I'll end with this. Well, I don't know if I'm going to end with this. Frankly, I'm never going to end. No. Um, the other thing that I really want to point home to folks in animal welfare is please stop advocating for pet fees. Please stop saying that landlords can make more money because they um, can charge a pet fee. You know who can't afford pet fees? Um, folks of color huh? that are in low income folks of color or anyone. And frankly, when my dog was alive, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't do anything. You think he could pay pet rent? Holy moly, I can barely pay rent, let alone my dog. Stop advocating for pet fees as a way that landlords can make more money. Landlords don't need to make more money because landlords don't need to make profit over people. What you know what landlords need to do? Probably stop lording over the land and we just need to start housing folks and their pets. Okay, with that, I feel complete. Well done. <laughs> and totally agree on the, the pet fee issue and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we've done surveys of landlords about what they are interested in and what they want to see from pet owners. And what they really like hearing isn't that you can collect pet fees, it's that you're going to keep tenants longer because when housing is pet friendly, folks tend to stay in it much longer and landlords do not like having vacant units. So you get better tenants who stay for a longer time. That's the argument that really works with landlords. Um, and since we're not gonna get them to stop lording over the land anytime soon, um, we might wanna take that tack. Um, so uh, I, I forgot to describe myself at the beginning. I'm sorry about that. I am, um, I'm an old white dude, uh, like 5'8", and I'm wearing a black polo shirt. Uh, so as the official old white dude, next I would like to talk about hip hop. Um, believe me, this is on point. Um, years ago, when I was a baby lawyer, I first learned about pit bulls and hip hop because I was drafting a contract to film a music video. Uh, I was representing the club where they were filming the video and it's a DMX video called No Love For Me. 
um, with a number four and me is spelled M3. Um, but the stage was constructed out of cages and the cages had pities in them. Um, so I'm drafting up this contract. I'm working with the various parts. And let me tell you, our insurance company was not happy about having pities involved in this filming event. And I liked it both. I, I didn't understand what the problem was. Um, and I asked around with some folks in the industry and they're like, oh yeah, it's because they associate rappers and pit bulls with violence and it being a problem, some unspecified amorphous problem in their heads. And therefore it was hard to ensure the suit. We, we got around it and I gotta say DMX is a really nice guy and he loves his dogs. Um, but that was my first encounter with what I've since become interested in, the overlay between racism and breed discrimination. And it's not even a subtle overlay. It is omnipresent. Um, and a, an excellent uh, author, uh, Ann Linder at Harvard Law, uh, who um, runs their one of their animal law programs, wrote a fantastic law review article called The Black Man's Dog. And she traces the history of breed-specific legislation and how it arose at, in parallel with the rise of hip hop music and the negative reaction of a lot of people who look like me to hip hop music and the presence of dogs. Because prior to the 70s, people did not think of pities as threatening dogs. They were America's breed. Um, there's no good evidence that they're more dangerous than any sort of dogs, but they were popular among folks who were unpopular with a lot of landlords. Um, so it became very much a pretext to keep people of color out of housing. Um, it's ridiculous, and but the issue is very well researched. And right now it seems pretty glaringly obvious that the lack of affordable, decent housing for people of color with dogs is a product of nothing but racism. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at the end of what I have to say. Um, but I would like to, you know, turn it over to questions or any other comments. Thank you both so much for just telling truth. And I think, you know, Diana, you said it about we have to acknowledge, we have to talk about this, about all the intersections and just really appreciate both of your expertise and uh, courage in bringing this forward. And yes, yeah, it looks like we're getting some questions from the audience. You can put them in the Q&A and Whova. I also want you both gave so much important information. I know this is a short talk, but if you each had to say, what's the most important thing that folks should take away from the talk today? Start with you, Brian, and then and, uh, Diana, if you go next. I think the most important thing you could take away is this gets better through baby steps. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're, we don't have a magic wand to fix it. We can't eliminate other folks' biases other than through the slow, painful slog of education and reason and occasionally being patient with people who don't necessarily deserve patience. But little things like building out pet-friendly domestic violence shelters, I'm recently working with the LGBT Center, who has a homeless shelter for uh, for uh, young people, mostly people of color. And I've been working with them. They've been casually allowing pets into the program. Uh, but I think it's vitally important to make sure that folks seeking those services know that they can bring their pets, because otherwise a lot of folks would just rather stay outside than to get services. So I think the most important takeaway is baby steps. Even though they're frustrating, uh, it really, really makes a big impact. Yeah, um, agree. Uh, agree with that, right? Like small steps lead to it's like a marathon, right? So it gets mm -hmm. like acknowledging your small wins. Um, I also think that, particularly for animal welfare folks, that knowing that all of our all of our issues are intersected, right? Um, just like for housing, if there's an employment bill going on or like, or something in regards to employment and furthering employment rights and protecting employers in order to be able to protect employers where they're the ones that are going to be paying the rent. And so that intersects with myself. So understand that like when there's a renter's protection bill, 
read it. Like be like, oh, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Heart LA. I'll help look over whatever, you know, renter bill. I know, right? Like now I'm just like looking over renters bills throughout all of the um, United States. No, but they're intersected, right? Or if there's an animal welfare bill that criminalizes some, some type of behavior, that has an effect, right? Who's getting hurt? It's not like normally, like it's, it's people of color that are getting criminalized and that's going to take that on. So understand that when you're protecting the animal, who really are we protecting in the bigger context of things? It's not like we're all interconnected together. So what I do is going to affect what you do. So pause and think like, huh, what is this going to really like help? Um, and love. Um, well, if you take one thing out of here, just um, when all else fails, y'all, you know, just like take a deep breath and be like, I'm just going to remember love and whatever that is. Oh, and dance. Okay. <laughs> you get three. That works. Can you, I love what you just talked about in terms of something that might actually, and it could be unintended, right? But that there's consequences that criminalize or affect people. Can you give an example of something that, especially thinking like, oh, this is going to help the animal, but then actually it could really negatively impact the person who's caring for the animal. Yeah, like, you know, like tethering laws, right? Like a lot of folks are- what like, I was going to say. Oh my gosh. You know, and so, yes, is it, do you want your animal tethered? No, but, some, but at times, I mean, I just heard truly, an attorney told me about a case that the landlord took away the fence in the front of the yard. And so the client- in order, you know, and then people would say, well, why wouldn't she just walking the dog? Point being, she would um, tether the dog or like, you know, put the dog on the leash in the front so that the dog could be outside. But the reason that that was happening is because the landlord took away the fence from the front. And so the, but the judge couldn't get out of his head that she was tethering the dog. And she's like, well, the, well, well, you know, there's, you can't do that. That's against the law. That's against, the, it's like, okay, well, putting that aside, like, yes. And like, but why? Like, why can't we just talk to the person and be like, really the issue was is that the landlord took away her fencing, right? She wasn't even being tethered the dog the landlord didn't take away her fencing, but the landlord took away her fencing. And so now you're making the single mom, that's what it was like, a single mom with three kids like that didn't have, there's my, so that's like an example. And if, if I can add to that, I mean, I've worked with an organization called the Coalition for Unchained Dogs out of North Carolina. They do fantastic work absolutely fantastic work and they're against tethering as much as anybody but instead of lobbying to criminalize folks they go around to less affluent areas of town and offer to build fences for people it's an extremely inexpensive intervention it's it's, it's good for the dogs it's good for the families it's safer for the neighbors um and it's a solution that doesn't rely on a bunch of racist and classist assumptions about you know where your dog should be living most of the time you know if you're if you're in a, a rich city dweller in a beautiful condo you know your dog probably sleeps in your bed with you but, but i grew up in the country and our dogs are outdoors all the time it's perfectly normal in a lot of communities and cultures and the assumption that the only way to care for and love pets is the way that folks in you know nice white suburbs do it is just not okay So it looks like we have time for one question from the audience. And Crystal asks, how do you navigate legal help for those who have been discriminated, discriminated against surrounding a housing issue? Diana, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, how do you navigate for legal help? So I guess it depends what state you're in. And look, here's the reality is that it's um it's tough to get legal help. <laughs> it's it's tough to get legal help and especially for a discrimination. Um, okay, actually, let me uh, let me start. Every state, or at least in the state of California, there's like a there's a, in the state of California, there's the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Okay. So you can file a complaint, and most states will have their Department of Fair Employment or of something to enforce their fair housing laws, their state fair housing laws, if not federal fair housing laws. So if you're, let's say, in the state of California, you'd file a complaint with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Um, I would then, if you're not in the state of California, maybe like Google, like, what is likened to my Department of Fair Employment and Housing? And they can file a complaint there. Because, look, you don't need an attorney <laughs> to, to have to do that. 
they may not take your case. And then you need to look for an attorney and try to find like legal aid um, for that, you know, housing rights. Um, at, we, I'm like, I didn't really answer the question. I didn't even finish answering that question. It's tough to navigate for help, but you can start there. Start there. If I hope that was helpful. Or also reach out to me. I think my info is on there or send me a message and I can help guide you better than this terrible answer. <laughs> You're great. We'll also pop uh, both of your organizations in the chat, the links to them. You can also go on the Whova app and connect directly with Brian and Diana. Thank you both for your knowledge and wisdom uh, in the short talk today. And we're now heading into a 15 minute break, which lasts into, until 5 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Pacific. And after the break, there are four simultaneous one hour workshops for office hours. 